Hey guys, welcome to Steve Knows, and I'm naming today VR Appreciation Day. So I want to go back to VR's infancy so we can see how it's grown and how it's developed over the years, and the failed attempts that make it such an incredible time to be alive, and that we get to experience virtual reality, seeing it grow and succeed. So let's turn back the clocks all the way to 1838. 1838, Charles Wheatstone discovered an illusion of the mind, a discovery on how our brain processes imagery. He was able to demonstrate that if you put two two-dimensional images over each eye, the brain will process it as a 3D image. And looking at these images through a stereoscope, it gave the user a sense of depth. The images weren't moving, of course, back in 1838, but it still created three-dimensional space from a flat image. This is the first step into our VR worlds. The following year, William Gruber patented the Stereoscope Viewmaster, which used Charles' concepts and started selling it as a virtual tourism product. Moving to 1849, we had another product, top of the range in the 19th century from Sir David Brewster, a wooden box where you could insert images and make use of natural light to brighten them. VR became stagnant and didn't have any progress for 80 years from this point. So in 1929, we often in the modern day think of virtual reality as in gaming, our HMD headsets. But virtual reality in its broader sense is a simulation. Edward Link created the Link Trainer. This is a flight simulator less than a few decades after the Wright brothers took flight. While Orville did, Wilbur didn't have much luck. This Link Trainer was the first mechanical simulator using rudders and motors to create the effect of turbulence in flight. People needed safer ways to train pilots before letting them into the sky, risking their lives. The military bought six of these units for $3,500. And in World War II, these flight simulators trained half a million pilots. So it's a pretty important moment in simulation tech and the world. The next year in 1930, technology has always been influenced by what creative minds can invent. And commonly we see these visions through sci-fi movies as writers ponder on where the world is going and what could be possible. In 1930s, a science fiction writer, Stanley G. Weinboom, writes a story called Pygmalion Spectacles. Well, that is a title from the olden days. This story contained a pair of spectacles or glasses that would allow the wearer to experience magical worlds through the sense of sight, smell, taste and touch. Very much like where VR is going, but it's still not completely there yet. In the 1950s, Morton Heilig's Sensorama sounds like a circus reveal. Morton Heilig was a cinematographer, so being in the movie business, he had plenty of experience with cameras. He developed an attraction that was the combination of an arcade cabinet and an optometrist's office. You sat on a chair and you put your face into a hole of the cabinet. In here, you would experience stereo speakers allowing for the panning of audio, a 3D movie would play, and a fan would blow certain smells to immerse you into the environment, and the chair vibrates to simulate disturbances. In his lifetime, Morton created six movies for the Sensorama, which he edited, filmed, and produced himself, titled Motorcycle, Belly Dancer, Helicopter, June Buggy, A Date with Sabina, and I'm a Cola Bottle a really passionate pioneer. Moving to the 1960s, Morton did not stop there. This is the time of the first official head-mounted display with his next invention, the Telesphere mask. It didn't have any outside tracking. It was a HMD version of the Sensorama with 3D stereoscopic wide vision view and stereo sound. But finally, we have a wearable HMD over a hundred years after the discovery of stereoscopic images. But have no fear, 1961 is here. Just a year later, we get motion tracking. The motion tracking wasn't applied to the 3D movies created by Morton. Instead, this was two engineers from the company Philco. Comier and Brian created a headset for military use called Headsight. The user would wear the HMD and would view remotely with a camera, the battlefield or the war zone safely, using magnets and closed circuits to pick up the movement the user was able to look around through the headset. Now, we are making progress. In 1965, we get the concept of VR, modern day virtual reality. This concept is called ultimate display, a concept and an idea from Ivan Sutherfield, a computer scientist where he believed reality 
could be simulated so well, one could not tell the difference between that and reality. That sounds like a millennial horror movie. The concept spoke of viewing the world through a head-mounted display that would provide feedback to the user, including the ability to interact with objects in this virtual world, and it's all simulated by a computer that has the ability to run and maintain a virtual world in real time. Not fake time, real time. A quote here from Ivan's paper, the ultimate display would, of course, be a room within which the computer can control the existence of matter. A chair displayed in such a room would be good enough to sit in. Handcuffs displayed in such a room would be confining. A bullet displayed in such a room would be fatal. With appropriate programming, such a display could literally be the wonderland into which Alice walked. Now in 1968, we get the first HMD that was connected to a computer, utilizing computer generated imagery to display basic wireframes into the headset. Because, well, this was the 60s and power is limited. It wasn't the most appealing headset either. It was so heavy, it had to be suspended from the ceiling to support its weight. It was known as the Sword of Damocles, a story that highlights the fear within power. The next year, in 1969, this is another step towards the world we know as VR. So far, we've had 3D visuals, stereo audio, and tracking, but we haven't had actual interaction with computerized objects, which is what happened in 1969. Myron Kruger had many VR projects, but he used the term artificial reality, and these projects were called Glowflow, Metaplay, and Physics Space, which all led to the development of Video Place. Video Place could analyze and process the user's interactions in the real world and translate them into interactions with virtual objects. Kruger even stated in his findings that the fidelity of the images were far less important than the interactions, and that still stands to this day. And then a nice little gap where everyone put their feet up until 1987. 1987, the term virtual reality finally became popularized in modern culture. This was heavily influenced by Jaron Lanier, the founder of VPL. Not this VPL, but Visual Programming Lab. They have created a range of virtual reality products such as the Data Glove and the iPhone HMD. This was the first company to start selling these range of products and the iPhone HRX cost $49,000. The creation of these products was a huge advancement in VR haptics. In 1991, the Virtuality Group pushed virtual reality arcade cabinets into arcades. These arcades were much more popular and were not like they are today. This was a big deal. Players would have to wear a set of goggles and play on these machines with real-time stereoscopic 3D imagery. They were even able to land these cabinets and play multiplayer games in 1991. Then in 1992, some of you may remember this, a very rare, creepy, crazy movie called The Lawnmower Man. And if you haven't seen it, watch it. This film's popularity brought the concept of virtual reality to the masses, not just the enthusiasts in a time when gaming and tech were not like they are today. The movie even took the name of the Virtual Programming Lab founder as one of the main characters. It's about a scientist who uses virtual reality as therapy on disabled patients. Yep, I told you this film is messed up. In 1993 and 1995, Nintendo and Sega released virtual reality headsets. The Sega VR for the Mega Drive was showcased at a consumer electronics show to create buzz. It had head tracking, LCD display, and stereo sound, but the device never got out of its prototype phase, and because of this, it was a huge flop for Sega. But then in 1995, Nintendo gave it a go with the Virtual Boy, I really wish I had one of these things, originally known as the VR32, this was a portable VR headset. This was released in Japan and North America for a cheap price of only $180, but it failed to sell. The graphics were red and black, no one made games for it so there was terrible third party support, and only a year after Virtual Boy's release, it was discontinued. Nearly 20 years later, in 2012, a Kickstarter campaign came looking for $250,000 for the development of a virtual reality headset that can be used for medical science, space exploration, and military use. This little thing was called the Oculus Rift, which reached 2.5 million in funding, 10 times its target. The Kickstarter campaign is still available to view, I'll put a link in the description, it's a good gander. 
This project was later purchased by Facebook for $2 billion in 2014. In 2016, we have the release of the touch controllers from Oculus at a whopping $199 but they are now enabling us to have more granular interactions with objects, deepening our immersion. I can do a thumbs up, grab objects like in real life, throw them as I would, point at things, flick them. These controllers are so good you can't go back once you've tried them. And the same year we get the Vive from HTC, we get the official release of the Rift from Facebook, we get PSVR bringing virtual reality to home consoles, selling over 4 million units which is incredible. To the modern day, 2019, we now have the Oculus Quest, the Vive Focus, standalone untethered headsets, Vive Cosmos, a tethered headset, the Rift S, Valve Index, and the Valve Knuckles taking it a step further, where we have the ability to fully let go of the controllers and lose sense of holding a remote. And all of these experiences are being powered by hardware that people in the 60s could have only dreamed of. Now the VR industry is worth over $27 billion, with an estimated $55 billion in 2022. It's a misconception that VR is used for gaming only, but VR is used for training all over the world for medical use, training surgeons, doctors, military use, P police use it for counter-terrorism training, we have flight simulations, architects, the list goes on. Every day, it's almost like reality is becoming virtual reality. So I hope you found this travel in time interesting. It's always good to learn about what you enjoy and how it got to this moment because nothing just exists. It's taken years and years of people's research and dedication for us to experience these amazing games. So a big thank you from me. Thanks for watching Steve Knows. Happy gaming, guys. Good day.